Yeah, so what we're going to do is we get a new marina carabao up on the table, and then and then when you guys have finished that session, we're going to go on to like the new that component. We'll then swap the top table around because we haven't done enough space for everyone. Oh, so we're going to do that. Yeah, we're going to take a seat now. Get the hands up. Yeah, that's cool. 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 Yeah, that's
Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we appreciate that for many of you and us, it's already the end of a very long day. And uh, so we very much appreciate that you are still here. And uh, we hope we can keep you awake with the interesting things we have here to present. Um, I also appreciate it's a little warm in here. We have opened the door at the back and um, there is also water available at the back of the room if, uh, if you feel like you, you need it. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll kick off straight away. Um, welcome to this side event. This is um, the World Health Organization side event. And I am going to pass directly over to our head of office of the WHO here in Bonn and for the welcome and introduction, um, Elizabeth Paunovic. Thank you, James. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to WHO side event at the 46th uh, meeting of the subsidiary bodies to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We are really glad to have you here, uh, as James already pointed out. It's the end of a working day. It's almost the end of the working week. We know that you are tired. We will try to be as concise as possible. Thanks for your interest and thanks for coming. In this side event, uh, we would give you an update on the work of the WHO on the health impacts of climate change and its drivers, uh, but also on the health gains uh, from cutting greenhouse gas emissions. We are going to hear presentations and interventions on many different aspects of this work. And uh, in my capacity of the head of WHO European Center for Environment and Health, which is located here in this campus, in this tall building called Lange Eugen on the 17th floor. I would also like to inform you about uh, the work of the center, the work on the climate change very briefly, and to invite you to visit us whenever you are attending uh, uh, climate change events, but also on uh, another occasions. In fact, uh, UNFCCC is the biggest agency here, but uh, we are 19 agencies dealing with the UN agencies dealing with uh, different aspects of uh, environmental protection. So our center belongs to WHO Regional Office for Europe. We are so-called geographically dispersed office. We were uh, uh, founded uh, taking uh, into action the decisions of the first ministerial conference on environment and health held in Frankfurt in 19, back in 1989, but on this location from the year 2000 we are located. And uh, in fact, uh, our center has a very, very long and uh, productive uh, history of pioneering work in the area of climate change and health, beside different areas. We deal with air quality and health, uh, chemical safety and health. Uh, uh, we are dealing with industrially contaminated sites. We are dealing with water and sanitation uh, and health. Uh, we are dealing with occupational health aspects, noise and health, different uh, environmental um, hazards and risks uh, to human health. So today, uh, our, together with me, we have several colleagues, James, who greeted you, uh, Gerardo Sanchez, also from the center, Oliver Schmoll, program manager for water, sanitation, climate, and Keshini, Vladimir Kendrovsky, our dinner, they're all here. And, uh, uh, as I said, our center has a long and productive history of pioneering work in the area of climate change and health. And uh, our work has been focused on assessments of uh, health in climate change in a European context, as well as uh, some of our ongoing work uh, will be presented on understanding the health co-benefits of uh, um, uh, national determined contributions. So that is uh, for the, the brief introduction. Thank you very much one more time for coming. And uh, I would like to ask James to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, so that's a little introduction to the WHO here in Bonn, and we very much um, work within a European um, context. But um, now I'd like to pass on to our colleague from Geneva, Marina Maero, who is now going to give a introduction on the, the global health and climate action agenda. Um, Marina? Thank you, 
much for introduction. Thank you to everybody for attending this late session here in Bonn. So what I'm going to present, in fact, is a global action agenda that the public health community put together after Paris. So just to start with uh, this slide, where we actually say the public health community really welcomed the Paris Agreement as a public health treaty. For us, we have said since the beginning, since we finally got a Paris Agreement, but also while we were advocating for an agreement, that for us, a public health community, this is important. Climate change, addressing climate change is important because for us, this is tackling major health problem, major health issue. It's a public health treaty indeed. And we welcome very much the fact that in the agreement preamble, there is a reference to right to health. And we are really glad to have with us the representative of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, uh, Benjamin. I mean, thank you for joining us in this panel, and it will tell us more about the connection between cl climate change and rights, uh, human rights and right to health. And also we welcome very much the reference to the health co-benefit. But uh, why we are really um, interested in climate change? Well, it's simply because uh, uh, all the major killers that we are dealing with in the global uh, uh, health agenda, extreme weather event, malaria, diarrhea, undernutrition, they are all climate sensitive diseases. And we know that with climate change, their impact on human health will be exacerbated. And we know also that most of the sectors that are generating greenhouse gases are in fact also impacting on health burden. And, and more and more, while emissions are unfortunately increasing. So a few examples here you see from transport, el electricity, agriculture, industry. And I'm sure you have seen these, uh, these slides several times in our presentation in the past. So, but then I want to highlight that the most striking figures that unfortunately we are uh, uh, collecting and publishing every day in media now, not only in our public, WHO publication, is these very scaring figures of 6.6 .6 million people dying every year from air pollution alone. So, oops. So what we have done actually, uh, prior to Paris, we got interested in understanding which was the status of health response to, uh, at global level. So we had done an analysis together in collaboration with our colleague from the World Medical Association, and we are very happy to have some representative with us this evening. They will talk to us more about other initiatives later on. And then we see that, as you can see from these figures, that lo the, the, um, uh, among the total amount of uh, uh, NDC's uh, submission to uh, prior to, to Paris, uh, more than 80% of the long income country national uh, NDC's they were referring to health, they were mentioning health, both on adaptation and mitigation, but mainly on adaptation. Unfortunately, when you will, we, go, we went and we look at how much has been, was actually uh, invested on climate adaptation, as you can see from, from the graphic uh, on, on my left <laughs> and on your right, uh, unfortunately, a very tiny portion of the total amount of finance for climate uh, was uh, basically going to the health sector. So what we have done as a public health community, we took uh, the Paris Agreement very seriously. Also the call uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, French presidency and the incoming uh, Moroccan presidency to bring like, the, the um, Paris Agreement into action as soon as possible. So immediately after Paris, uh, in July uh, 2016, in collaboration with uh, our uh, um, UNFCCC colleagues and the, the two presidency COP21 and 22 we gather in Paris for the second global conference on health and climate and we put together a really concrete agenda for action for the health community so the, the agenda you can see uh, the main title of the six of the five main points on this slide the, uh, is focusing on health adaptation mitigation economics uh, engagement with the public health community and, and, and measuring health impacts. I will go through very quickly through this point to highlight the most important uh, uh, information we would like to share with you tonight, but then you can find the action agenda online on our web page. So when we look at the uh, health adaptation to climate change, we mainly decided to put together 
um, uh, to uh, uh, like a sort of to kind of launch a sort of commitment, and we have the we we committed under this agenda to work with UN partners to double annual investment in health adaptation to climate change uh, from now through to 2020, with a special focus on surveillance and climate resilience, in particular on sustainability energy for the healthcare facilities. And I would like in particular to highlight some of the tools available at the moment online this is a tool for project managers and working on climate change and health available on our web page and again i don't go too much into details for uh, sake of time and also because again you find everything on our web page but i would like really to stress uh, the some some of the existing materials being super important for the implementation adaptation and resilient project in particular uh, the guidance that we have on how to develop a health component of the nap and the operational framework for building climate resilient uh, health system and as well as the vulnerability adaptation ad assessment and many others that again you can see on these slides but also uh, don't worry if i'm going too fast and there are too many information on the slide you cannot capture we are super open and we can share this information with you later on so going then to the uh, second item of this global agenda we look at co-benefit we look at mitigation and then we put together uh, uh, a list of uh, uh, mitigation measures that we consider fundamental for, for co-benefit co for health. I don't go too much in details in the co-benefit aspect because my colleagues, uh, my colleague uh, Gerardo will give you more uh, detailed information on the, on, the, on the interesting connection between co-benefit and mitigation action. What I wanted to tell you is just uh, under our global action agenda, we will assess the number of deaths from air pollution at global, regional and uh, national level. And we, um, expected uh, this we will try to assess the expected health gain from uh, disease and again Gerardo will tell you more about this specific commitment that we have on uh, our global agenda and potential uh, and the potential for larger gains through more ambitious action so going uh, quickly also to the economic aspect uh, which is one of the points uh, also of our action agenda that is very important uh, to us, especially after we got inspired by the funding of uh, uh, IMF uh, report from 2013. I don't know if you're familiar with this report, probably you have seen these figures already, but according to IMF, uh, basically, uh, out of the uh, 3. Uh, uh, sorry, 5.3 uh, trillion of US dollar that every year are spent on uh, energy subsidies, approximately 50% are the equivalent of unpaid health bill for, from air pollution. And what IMF, IMF uh, colleagues, they are telling us that is that pricing carbon in line with uh, the health impacts uh, would have cut, in fact, 50% of the uh, uh, air pollution uh, death that we have seen just before in the previous slide, and also contribute to a cut of 20% of CO2 emission and generate 3% of GDP in taxes. So don't ask me from how they got to this <laughs> figure, so you can ask them or also to Gerardo <laughs> later, because we are going also to look at a more interesting exercise that we are doing on the, the economic side. But what we have committed again under our global agenda is to work with the UN and other partners to define coherent approach to link the economic of climate and environment and health and how to value this climate and energy policy in order that they are relevant and of interest at national level. So, in fact, I was telling you that we have more to say about uh, 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 economics because thanks to the uh, uh, work done by the, our European uh, office and uh, specifically the, the, the Bond Center, uh, we have an economic tool for uh, costing the uh, climate change health impacts on adaptation, but also a very, very interesting future project uh, that Gerardo will talk about on develop developing methodologies for estimating in fact health and carbon, health related um, economic benefits of the mitigation action that uh, are uh, considered under, under the NDCs, but also under sustainable transport policy. But again, Gerardo will tell you more. So in, in terms of engaging with health community, we are really happy to have here, in fact, this evening, some representative of the, this community that is uh, collaborating with us, the FMSA, the WMA, we will introduce, uh, and also um, Climate Tracker, we will introduce them later. What I wanted to stress here is also important, uh, raising awareness and mobilizing health community campaign that we are doing in collaboration with the CCC is, a, is a, an important communication campaign called Breathe 
life. Uh, probably you have heard about this, but the commitment again is by 2020 we will triple the number of countries in which health professional organization engage strongly on this issue, the issue of climate change and health, of course, and assure commitment from health organization representing 30 million health professionals. So, and again, here you have some of the main products and tools we have for awareness raising on, uh, on uh, the FMSA training manual that uh, will be presented later on how we kind of engage with future health professional uh, training them on the understanding the impact of climate change on health, but also we have agenda mainstreaming uh, uh, guidance and uh, tools to address gender issue and climate and health. But lastly, and one of the most important points of this action agenda is the measuring national progress on climate change and health. This is an exercise we initiated actually together with the UNFCCC and uh, former head of UNFCCC, Cristiana Figueres, at our first conference on climate change and health in Geneva in 2015. We decided together we need to monitor the impact of climate change on health and, and, uh, to, and we started together to produce with several different partners producing the um, country profile, what is called country profile, and um, we have already 40 country profiles online. I want to explain what a country profile is by giving you the example of the US. Not to be provocative, but actually to give you a good news that despite all the political momentum, we managed in January to finalize the, the country profile for the US and actually to get the authorization to upload it online. So I, I go through this very quickly, the country profile of the US and many of your countries, uh, Germany, France, and several others, uh, they are online and you can have a look and several others are on the production. So what we look at in our country profile is current and future climate hazard. And uh, so, um, and then uh, current and future health risk. In this case, for example, for US, you can see that we analyze the hurricane induced floods effect in, uh, in the US from uh, the, uh, the 80s up to the 2018. And also the um, several case report from uh, changes in Lyme disease distribution also uh, for the last 15, 15 days, 15 years, sorry, and uh, health related mortality, agriculture, food security. We have a big uh, coverage on all the outdoor air pollution impacts. But also what, uh, what we have, uh, we, what we collect is also information about national initiative and commitments. And as you can see, I like it. They're very glad to inform you, you know very well that in 2016, US in fact uh, 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 formally enters into the Paris Agreement. But uh, leaving US aside for the moment, what we are committed under this agenda as the WHO and UNFCCC is to continue producing this country profile and the aim is to have by 2020 a regular climate change and health country profile with national evidence and progress uh, tracking for at least uh, 80, 80 nations. So if you do belong to a country that doesn't have a country profile yet, please come consult with us. We are super happy to support you in developing uh, your country profile. And then lastly, I would like to close with an information. I don't know if there is any of the Italian delegation representative in the room, but then we have been uh, informed by the G7 presidency, the, uh, the Italian G7 presidency, that this year the, the special gathering of the Ministry of Health for, under the G7, which is happening in Milan, at uh, the end of at uh, the beginning of November, exactly at the same time when the COP23 will start, uh, they will focus on climate change and health. And the aim is to launch a global strategy, global initiative, and uh, of the mitigation of uh, the health, the effect of climate change on planetary health. So, and then uh, together with Italians, now we are producing, in fact, the country profile together with some of the uh, national institutions to make sure that. Uh, the, uh, the G7, all the G7 countries will be covered with the country profile. In fact, we have all G7 country, country profile, actually apart from Italy and Japan that are under production. And then with the Italian case, we will have a specific also reference to some of the funding that uh, the Italian are uh, um, collecting thanks to a national exercise uh, through a matrix that is, uh, in fact, uh, addressing all the issues that you can see on this uh, on this slide so i don't in the interest of time i don't want to go too much into detail into this exercise of the g7 but just for you to know there is also during the 2017 this occasion to bring health up into the agenda of the g7 and we hope you can work with us in advocating for more and more so just thank you
Thank you very much, Marina. I think that was a very good overview on really showing how health has been central to climate action and continues to be. Um, and I think many of you who have been following um, both the COPs and the meeting of the subsidiary bodies for many years now, um, we here as a, at the WHO, but also with all our other health partners, have really been actively working to make sure that health is a key component of the negotiations. Um, and, and also many thanks to Marina for um, the years of work that she has also put into really keeping, keeping health at the top of the agenda there. Um, I, overall, we want to stick to questions at the end of the, of the event. If someone does have a very, very specific question purely linked to a slide or a clarification, we can take them. But otherwise, I would really like to um, leave them until the end of the, end of the session, and then we'll have a discussion, and we can take um, free questions from the floor. Um, uh, we've already had a, a little teaser there from Marina as to what the next presentation is. She's actually mentioned <laughs> Gerardo's presentation um, a couple of times. Um, and now we'll, we'll pass over. So my colleague um, Gerardo Sanchez Martinez will now present some of, the, um, some of the work that we've been doing in our office. Gerardo, over to you. Thanks, James. Um, and thanks to everyone for being here. <coughs> First, I'd like to apologize in case I'm not able to finish my presentation because because I happen to be suffering at the same time a cold and hay fever. I'm a lucky man. But if I'm not able to finish, my uh, colleague, Professor Kandrovsky, will be able to do it probably better than I am. <laughs> so I'd like to explain a little bit uh, what we are learning about this concept of co-benefits between mitigation and, and health, or more broadly, the links between uh, mitigation policies and health. As Marina has mentioned, um, one may wonder why is it that WHO is working on these things. Uh, Marina has mentioned it, but uh, we actually have a very solid mandate to be working on these matters, and it's very specific as well. So we are to be working on tools to assess risks and benefits of adaptation and mitigation, and we take that very seriously because those policies have far-reaching consequences uh, for health and for social determinants of health as well. So we do have a specific mandate, <clears throat> both globally and at the regional level as well. So we had one very strong in 2010 in Parma, and we're heading for another one soon in June in Ostrava in the Czech Republic, and the commitments for climate change and health are very strong as well. The WHO European region <clears throat> is a very, very diverse one. So we have 53 member states, uh, of which seven are low middle income countries. And so there are countries like Norway with over 62,000 US dollars of GDP per capita. And there's places like Tajikistan with under 3,000. And all of those want us to provide more or less coherent policy advice. So this is quite a challenge. In terms of mitigation and health, the underlying principle is actually quite simple. So there are some actions, some policies, that contribute to reduces greenhouse gas emissions and also can significantly benefit health and vice versa. There are health policies that actually cut carbon emissions. And so what we want is to capitalize on that while making sure that health is always protected from every angle. We have very good evidence on a few of those types of policies. First, reducing air pollutants through changes in energy systems in general, energy efficiency, production, uh, landfills, etc. Also, particularly in low-income countries, the access to reproductive health services, insofar as it contains overpopulation, uh, can also uh, cut carbon. That's also very well studied, but it's a very, very restricted set of countries where this actually could be taken. Decreasing meat consumption, especially from beef, so ruminants, and substituting low carbon healthy alternatives could contribute to lowering <laughs> NCDs, and it also contributes carbon emissions. Increasing active transport, meaning mostly cycling and walking, particularly in urban areas, and also increasing urban green space, which could at the same time reduce noise, urban heat island effects, and also sequester a modicum of carbon. So we have pretty good evidence in all of those. And the question is how to make those operational. Um, in Euro, we have three main ongoing lines of work. <clears throat> at the macro level, we want to get an idea of the possible effects 
of the implementation of the NDCs, if they were to be implemented on mortality and morbidity based on possible air pollution reductions. So we would like to see what are the benefits in terms of averted mortality and morbidity. Also, we want to look at how health systems can become more environmentally sustainable and also low carbon. And then urban interventions with potential co-benefits such as sustainable transportation for which we have a long tradition and a few tools available and then we're working on some more. AirQ Plus, which is our flagship um, air pollution health impact assessment tool and others in development like Greenness Plus, which would look at the possible health benefits of increased green spaces. We also globally have a wide variety of activities but Marina has covered most of them. <coughs> The NDCs in the Euro area are a very mixed bunch. Um, there we had like a screenshot. We wanted to understand what is it that we had that could be understood in common and what was different. And we saw that, of course, you know, the baselines are sometimes different. Um, the commitments obviously are different because they are nationally determined. But at least we have some recognizable blocks uh, in there. Of course, naturally, in our region, the EU28 is the most recognizable block, also responsible for the most emissions. And so to make sense of that, it's not, it's not easy in terms of how to make that operational to evaluate health impacts. So there we could see the intended reductions in the EU 28, Russia, uh, Turkey, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan. We're using ISO uh, codes with two letters, so it's a little bit more confusing, but at least you can see uh, the largest players there, <coughs> both in terms of emissions and of pledged emissions reductions, which are the EU28 on the one hand and Russia on the other. Based on that, we will be looking at an impact pathway analysis. Basically, we'd like to fill in the black box between the greenhouse gas emissions and what that would mean in terms of actual local uh, pollution. And for that, we would have to rely on the information that the countries have given to the UN of C, or that they publish at the sectoral level. Once we have an estimation of the um, concentration of pollutants, then we actually have very solid methodologies to understand first how the emissions turn into concentrations. So for that, in our case, we'd be using uh, the RUWM model. And then how ambient concentrations actually turn into health impacts. And for that, uh, we have been leading the way in concentration response functions to pretty much understand what is the attributable effect of those pollutants actually on morbidity and mortality. And then based on that, actually, uh, the economic evaluation is almost child play. It's really very easy, it's very standard. The OECD put together most of the methodologies that we use. Evaluation for preventive mortality, for morbidity, and for absenteeism and work loss. All of that is a standard. So what we want to do is make sure that we put all of this in it together in a way that makes sense from the standpoint of public health. Then we crunch some of the numbers. We actually did have some fair estimates of how different mitigation pathways could go. And what we could see is that obviously the most benefits were to be accrued by the blocks of emissions that had the largest emissions to begin with and that had pledged to reduce the most. So Russia and the EU28. These groupings, by the way, are just based on carbon emission profiles. So it's nothing to do with the official WHO groupings or regions. But you can see there at least the pattern that some regions would benefit more than others and it has to do with the emissions projected and also, of course, on the population affected. Then you could also see that you could change uh, the picture a little and then the Russian Federation would be <clears throat> skyrocketing in that sense because here it would be an element of trying to estimate on a per capita basis what the benefits could be. And so there is where the economics come into play, not only the population. And you would see actually that some countries and some blocks could stand to benefit a lot from actually implementing those policies. Now, <clears throat> There will be also uh, healthcare cost savings, and those are very important in a moment where the sustainability, the financial viability of many health systems is in question. And so you could see how reducing the air pollution 
that could come from implementing the NDCs could reduce a lot those clinical outcomes. And also non-clinical outcomes like restricted activity days that actually result in people not going to work, in work and settings. And all of that has costs not only for the individuals, but also for families and for society. In total, uh, we more or less figured out that between one to 2% of the GDP of the WHO European region could be gained netly uh, from that implementation in the time horizon that uh, they are set now. That is not negligible. That's one of the uh, lines of actions we're working on. And that methodology that you just say is something that is almost finals now. We have uh, various scientific expert meetings that have told us that the methodologies are sound and that it can be implemented. Uh, we are also working on the environmental sustainability of health systems, including low carbon. Previously, we dealt with many separate areas, waste management, wastewater resilient hospital, etc. But this has become a little bit of an integrated matter for us. We've had experts and national uh, focal point meetings in the last four years, many. We've been reviewing the evidence, not only peer reviewed, but also case studies. We have found out that the largest share uh, of uh, carbon footprint comes from procured goods. It is one of the seven priority areas in the upcoming European Environment and Health Ministerial Conference, and we're very hopeful that we'll get a strong commitments by member states. And the last uh, methodology that I wanted to highlight today has to do with <coughs> how to figure out the health benefits of sustainable transportation interventions. Here we plug a study, a case study from Lithuania, which you could see that at baseline in 2015, uh, will be more share of private cars than in 2050, and that cleaner alternatives would be growing at the expense of uh, private cars. And that would have different effects. And we want to make sure that we're capturing effects in a realistic way. So how would the actual use of different modes of transportation change? We'll uh, be looking at more use of cleaner fuels and less fuel needed for more passenger kilometers, transportation, more people, more kilometers. That's what we want, right? We also want more cycling and walking. We want that because there's more physical activity and because there is less pollution. It's a win-win situation. We also want to know what the effect will be in terms of emissions reductions for particulate matter, for SO2, for NO2, and for all the pollutants that we know have a strong impacts on health. And how that will uh, result in preventing premature mortality because that's what we really want to fight the most. There will be some benefits of more physical activity, but those will not be unlimited. And so we also want to know when an implementation would be uh, having the most effect. So we want to make sure that we're doing things at the right time as well. As you can see there in the curves, they're not absolutely linear. There's a little bit of a plateau effect. So we want to understand how those effects could also be taking place. And well, what I did, we could look at CO2 emissions as well, but those would be with very simple emissions factors. Um, this all would bring about health benefits and also economic benefits. And so we can look at the different estimates, but what you can see is that premature deaths and health morbidity, they both contribute uh, to the potential economic gains and health gains that we would have, and that those are not negligible. They are relatively high. And so we want to make sure that we are choosing the healthiest mitigation pathways so that we can achieve those health benefits and those health cost savings. We can also look at carbon costing considerations, uh, including market pricing and other possibilities. What we want is for professionals to be able to visualize all of those gains and trade-offs more or less at the same time. So in conclusion, there are potentially large health gains from NDC implementation. And those may happen as different implementations through different pathways. And health systems ought to be involved to ensure that the healthiest possible mitigation policies are implemented. Also, health systems should address their own carbon reductions because they are a large sector, 9% of the economy on average in the Euro region. So in the context of the SDGs, they need to address their sectoral responsibility. 
So ultimately, the link between health and climate policies needs to be implemented locally and based on the best possible evidence. WHO, uh, Euro, and globally will support member states in their efforts. In particular, we'll continue to work on tools, methods, guidance, and capacity building. That's all I have for today. Thanks. So that's all you have. I think that was quite a lot. <laughs> I think, that, and uh, thank you very much. I we appreciate that you uh, are not feeling 100% at the moment. But I think that was uh, that was a very interesting presentation. I think for a long time um, we've been arguing that there are health co-benefits of. Um, mitigation and I think it's a very important milestone for us that not only um, have we been saying that but we can actually prove it now we can actually put figures behind that claim um, and I think the one to two percent of European GDP just by implementing what countries have already put forward in their NDCs is actually a very strong um, argument for action and again it just supports the WHO call that health is central to climate action um, so thank you very much, Gerardo. I think that's that was a very good presentation. Um, I, I think we've got Marino twice on there, but I, I, the, the, the topic of uh, country profiles and G7, that was pretty well covered in your presentation earlier. So, <laughs> so, so rather than um, passing back to Marina, um, I am very happy to introduce Benjamin Schachter from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and again, as um, already alluded to in Marina's presentation about the human rights component here, it's, um, we're very happy to be able to have Benjamin here to present. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to my colleagues at the World Health Organization for this invitation. It's uh, really great to be here to talk about some of the work that, that OHCHR has done. On, climate change and human rights, and in particular on the right to health. And I want to start by responding to a couple of uh, things I've, I've heard so far um, related to the reason or the linkages between climate and health. And one linkage that's, that's very clear uh, to me coming from the sort of legal side is, is the, the language in the Paris Agreement itself. Um, so the preamble to the Paris Agreement says that all states, when taking climate action, uh, should respect, promote, and consider human rights, including the right to health and the rights of indigenous peoples and just transition, a number of, of rights related and social considerations. And, and so that um, is a really good starting point for, for how to make these kinds of arguments and linkages. And and you know the other the other question sort of posed is is why do this and, and there's a number of reasons, um, but the first reason and, and the one I like the most is is because it's the right thing to do to to think about how climate impacts people, and then work to prevent those negative impacts. And uh, there's been a lot of research done on the subject of climate change and its impacts on human rights. Uh, a lot of that research has been done by the world health organization and uh, actually was a great input for some of the work that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights did uh, last year. Um, and that's what I'm going to touch upon now is a, is a report that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, produced at the behest of the Human Rights Council. Um, so the Human Rights Council in a, in a resolution, uh, 29 slash 15, mandated that uh, the office produce an analytical study on climate change and its impacts on the right to health. And that study uh, took into account a panel discussion at the Human Rights Council in which um, the Director General of the WHO, I'm sorry, I almost said Surgeon General because I'm from the US, um, <laughs> but uh, the Director General, Margaret Chan, spoke and, and opened this event uh, alongside our Deputy High Commissioner. Um, and, and then we had a panel, and so it took into account the sort of inputs there from the panelists and from states and civil society, as well as a number of written inputs and our own independent research. And um, that study lays out, I think, in very concrete terms uh, what the impacts of climate change are on, on people, uh, which is, of course, very important. But then it, it goes on to describe what that means in terms of 
the human rights obligations of states. So all states have ratified at least one international human rights treaty, and many states have ratified nearly all of them. And, and there's three um, instruments, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, which are nearly universally ratified and form what we call the International Bill of Human Rights. And uh, these instruments protect the human right to health. Um, and in fact, the Committee on Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, which is the treaty body uh, responsible for, for monitoring the implementation of the commitments made in that, that particular treaty, has issued uh, guidance on the human right to health and has uh, recognized the, the issue of climate change as, as of particular concern. And the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, has has done likewise, calling climate change one of the greatest uh, threats to to the rights of the child that there is. Um, so when we look at all of these facts, we know climate change is man-made, we know climate change is impacting people, we then see that there's a clear human rights obligation. So beyond this moral and ethical um, reason to be looking at the links between climate change and health, there's a legal obligation that states have, which is derived from their commitments, which are made in the Paris Agreement and also um, through these international human rights treaties to protect the human right to health. Um, and I guess another, another thing that, that came to my mind listening to the previous presentations and, and the discussion of, of needing to better understand the data um, and the impacts of climate change on health is the issue of what kind of data is being collected. So a human rights-based approach to health would require that we look at who is impacted most by climate change and that when we take climate action, we make sure that we're helping those persons, groups, and peoples who are impacted most first. And, and I think, you know, in, in considering the, the health impacts, it's really important to understand that those impacts aren't borne equally across the population, but they affect most people living in poverty, uh, women and girls, indigenous peoples, um, and others who, who are in uh, disadvantageous uh, situations for, for a number of reasons. Um, so that's one element that the human right to health brings in. I'm not going to go through the entire report because I know that, <laughs> that there are many other speakers and, and they, they have a lot of interesting things to say. I do want to share with you a few recommendations from the, the report and, and the reference. And I also have with me a one-page summary of, of this report, as well as a second report, which was also... Uh, mandated by the Human Rights Council, which looks at climate change and its impacts on the rights of children. And within that report, there are also, uh, uh, or there is also a lot of analysis um, from a right to health perspective. So some of those key recommendations, and, and really the first and foremost one, is, is that states need to take immediate and urgent action to mitigate climate change. And, and every effort should be made to attain uh, or, or to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. What's really concerning now is, is that the ambition is, is there in the Paris Agreement, but it's not there in, in nationally determined contributions. Um, another recommendation had to do with, with something that, that my colleagues just touched on, which is taking actions that have co-benefits. Um, so so when, when you're thinking about mitigation and adaptation actions, taking those actions which will actually benefit people as well as planet, right? Because the, the, the mitigation, uh, you know, in particular, sometimes there's really negative human rights impacts from uh, different projects. Um, things like Red Plus, uh, biofuel, um, and hydroelectric dams sometimes displace lots of people and have other negative impacts. Um, and, and I think as a, a, another sort of threshold issue, we, to make populations more resilient to the impacts of climate change, uh, certain actions need to be taken to ensure uh, minimum core obligations with re regards to the right to health are protected, um, social protection floors, um, 
And, and also actions need to be taken to empower people to participate in climate policy. And so an important element, I think, of a right to health space approach is, is that it's very holistic. And you're looking at, at all of the different sort of determinants of health um, and, and considering them. So issues of, of non-discrimination, participation, poverty, um, et cetera, are all really linked in this, this discussion of health when you're looking at it from a rights to health uh, based approach. So I'm gonna stop there. The, the study is uh, A slash HRC 3223. Um, and I, I do have that one page summary here with me and I'm happy to share copies of that with anybody interested at the end. Thank you again very much for the opportunity to speak to you all. Thanks a lot, Ben. I think it's a, it's a really nice example of showing how different arms of the UN are working towards the same goal and supporting each other. And I think um, especially talking about um, climate change and the right to the highest attainable standard of health, well, that reflects very clearly the core mission of the WHO as defined in our constitution. So it's very, it's, it's very coherent. And that's, uh, I, that's, I think, very a good thing for us to be to be highlighting here. Um, also, as Ben touched on, was also um, linking back to what Elizabeth said earlier, is this issue of we now need to choose healthy mitigation options. So I think that was um, nicely reiterated. Um, I would like to give another hand to our, this round of panelists here. And at the same time, I would like them, if they would like to take a seat at the front of the, the room here, and we will swap the chan uh, panelists round. Thank you very much. While the next panelists come up to the table here, I'll briefly introduce them. We have Lina Damsgaard, who is a representative from the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. We have Sophia Lindgren, who is from the World Medical Association, and Andreas Zieber from Climate Tracker. And we're now going to hear some um, brief interventions from these three who are in particular going to show us on how um, we are engaging with future health professionals. They are the next generation and they're going to be the ones carrying forward our work. And I think I'd like to pass first the floor to Lena. Yes. Welcome. Thank you, James. Um, so, as James mentioned, I'm from the International Federation of Medical Students Associations and I'm here to talk a bit about some of the activities and some of the projects that we have both internationally and regionally as well as nationally. Um, and we focus mainly within two areas, which is capacity building and sort of policy. Um, and for both, we have a really great tool. You can take the next slide. Um, as Marina mentions, we have the um, training manual on climate and health, which was developed in collaboration between the WHO and IFMSA, which focuses on bringing together climate change and health, as well as youth advocacy. And this can be find on, found online and is a resource that um, sort of has a lot, um, both sort of training guides that you can use on a local level as well. And if anyone is interested in conducting trainings on climate and health specifically, uh, this is a resource that can be used to plan these things as well as to gain more insights. And if you take the next slide, um, I have a few pictures for you of some of the workshops that we've done. This is an international workshop that was conducted a few years ago. It has participants from more than 20 countries and from uh, some of the many regions we have in IFMSA. And they are all holding um, different examples of climate-related uh, um, impacts in their different countries that affect climate and health. And the next picture is from a workshop in Finland um, that had participants from all of the Nordic countries. And it was a four-day workshop um, that was only focusing on environment and health, um, both climate change and health, but also chemicals and water sanitation as well. And the next slide is a map of some of the initiatives that we have done in the past few years on capacity building. And as you see, we have um, many diverse projects from many places in the world, and I'm sure there's a few more that I have missed, um, some of the more local ones that haven't reached the, the international ears. Um, but we try to do capacity building sort of in, in different regions, and we try to, on an international level, uh, capacity build people to be able to 
go on a regional and local level and spread what they have learned. And the next slide is from the Global Climate Change Campaign, uh, which is responsible for 11 of the dots you saw on the map before. So it was started in India by our Indian national member organization, who involved 11 other national member organizations from the entire world to do a series of events over four months last year to raise awareness on climate change and the health effects. Um, so this was a really cool initiative that came from India having been empowered on an international level and using the training manual to be able to develop these events that would then take place all over the world. And the next slide moves us on to some of the more policy-related work that we do. So this is a picture of the IFMSA delegation from COP21, where we did an action to highlight some of the different health effects of climate change. Uh, so this is something we always try to do when we go to these things, is to sort of raise awareness on this issue in a simple manner that most people will understand. And the next picture is from the African regional meeting in IFMSA. So all of the African national member organizations met in Burkina Faso in 2016, in December. And they came together and made this uh, declaration, the Ukadugu, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, declaration on climate change and health um, to be used both um, to sort of <coughs> encompass what they had done at the regional meeting, but also to um, empower the different national member organizations to use this to raise awareness within the national governments. And the next slide is also the last slide. So this is a project called Code Green, which is from Australia. They work in very many different um, policy-related fields. They work a lot with divestment from the fuel, fossil fuel industry, as well as putting pressure on the Australian government. So these are some different examples of some of the activities we have in IFMSA that works on climate change and health. Um, there are many more, but I hope this illustrates that this is an issue that really concerns us as medical students. And it's one of the, the issues that we take very seriously because we know that it's something that we will be seeing when we enter the medical world as health professionals. And it's something that we'll have to deal with in the future. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lena. I think they, they probably chose a wagadugu just to trip you up in that, uh, <laughs> that presentation. <laughs> Um, I would like to now pass over to Sophia Lindgren, who is from the World Medical Association. Hello, uh, my name is Sophia Lindgren and I'm a medical doctor from Sweden uh, and I'm here representing the WMA. My presentation won't be as uh, nice with many pictures as Lina, but I hope you will still enjoy it. Uh, okay, so the World Medical Association is um, the main uh, association among different national medical associations and I'm from Swedish Medical Association. And uh, there we have a climate and health group that was just started where we're working with climate related health issues. So it's been really inspiring to hear all this work from the WHO to know that we're not alone in this work. Uh, and I'm here to do a short update on the latest that's been going on uh, at the WMA. And uh, one of the biggest things last year was our statement on divestment on fossil fuels. It's uh, a bit longer statement, so I just made it short here. But it was made last year in October at uh, the General Assembly. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I just read it out to you, but... Uh, it encouraged all national medical associations as well as health organizations to begin a process on transferring their investments uh, from energy companies whose primary business relies upon extraction of or energy generation from fossil fuels to those generating energy from renewable energy so sources. And um, as an as a medical association in Sweden, this statement was quite important because as medical doctors, it's, it can be quite slow to begin a process like this. And we tried in Sweden to do this divestment, but after the WMA made their statement, everything was made a lot easier since a big organization like that begins a process. So we're doing this thing this year. And I know the British Medical Association had, have done the same thing. And then we also made a press release this week in regards to the UNFCCC meeting here. And 
um, the main focus was the healthcare uh, professionals' role in the climate negotiations. And uh, the title was Physicians Warn Against Neglecting Health in Climate Talks. And there was also a statement by our president. And uh, I was reminded about this today when I had uh, a meeting with the Swedish delegation. Because uh, for us it's so obvious, these uh, health problems with uh, climate changes. But after talking to them, I realized it's really not that obvious for everyone. They weren't aware of it. and. They also mentioned that it wasn't really being an issue during the negotiations. So I really think it's important that we remember to continue to talk about this and not uh, take for granted that everyone else are being aware of it. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. And I think that also shows the, uh, the snowball effect of once you get, it's a lot of effort to get going, but yeah. once you get there, there's a, a lot of people start following, so um, well done. Um, for our last presentation here, I would like to pass over to Andrea Sieber. Do you need to sit that side? Are you okay? Oh, I <coughs> Oh yeah, maybe it's just. I am maybe. Okay, yeah, maybe that's yeah. the best. So Andrea Sieber from Climate Tracker. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for inviting me. And I think still it is the case that loads of panels talk about young people without actually any young person on the panel. So I think it's quite exceptional. I just want you to mention it is that I really appreciate that. Um, Climate Tracker is an organization of young journalists bringing young people to these negotiations to write about and report about it. That's one of the things we do. You know, are there any country delegates in the room who have been tracked or want to get tracked by us. Any country delegates? Seeing none. Okay. Anyway, um, in general, we are about, oh, there's someone. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, you might, maybe we're going to get in touch with another person wearing this t-shirt. But um, in general, what we are is a network of about 5,000 journalists from around 110 countries. Um, the vast majority of them is younger than 30 years old. And what we do is mainly three things. So we, we train young people online and offline. Um, we create writing competitions. So we say, OK, you have about one month to publish two articles on a certain topic. And then we set, incentivize that by, for example, fellowship to conferences like this. Um, and we create these competitions around topics we think that are particularly important, um, underreported, and get not the uh, attention they deserve or um, our particular strategic. I just want to mention this because I think and that's one of the reasons why we got into um, health communications <laughs> that very often we see that particular conservatives or these from a center to the right of the political spectrum, people are, have a um, lower probability to engage or to, to favor um, ambitious climate action, um, to, to believe in human-made climate change. And one narrative that particularly appeals to this uh, to this political spectrum is actually linking climate change and health. So that's one of the reasons why we started prior to Paris um, uh, a climate change and health campaign. So what we did was creating one of those competitions for weeks and it created um, 194 articles from 107 countries and uh, and what from, from 107 contributors in 50 countries. Um, about 32 no 32 were from developing countries. Um, and I think, or I just want to mention here that I think still the, the so I really valued how, how kind of geographically diverse it was, but I think still as a climate community, we did, we do not reach out to enough diverse geographies. We do not reach enough languages. I think if, if loads of campaigning, for example, India is done in English, not in Hindi. And I think that's, that's one thing we particularly want to tackle there. Um, so. For example, in, in Philippines, we had to think about 11,000 shares for, from the articles we've written there. And what we do in these competitions is com combine them with training. So um, we do that mainly online. And some of you might recognize this, this man. Um, so we did this in cooperation with, with the um, Lancet Commission. Also had some young journalists who specialize in climate coverage. Uh, and I think when it comes to, to this training, um, three, three thoughts for us are important to reflect first that online just enables us to reach a much broader audience 
because it, even if you go to a developing country and do a workshop, you normally don't just reach the people in the capital. Um, it, if you do it online, it's important to incentivize it, to make it efficient. Um, and then it is actually good to, to push people. So to not only just say, here, you have some training material, but to demand something. Also, if you bring them to these conference, I think part of empowerment is not only to give, but also to demand or push people forward. Um, and this is just an overview of the kind of media people reach there. So we had quite a, quite a um, yeah, sufficient number of, of, of articles which were published in, in leading media. And um, one, one thing then I, I want to end with, which showed us in the year we actually did this campaign, that, that the kind of empowerment we do was, was working, was that The Guardian published an article um, saying that the, the top young climate campaigners to watch before the UN Paris summit and actually 11 out of 12 has at some point gone through um, a climate tracker fellowship <laughs> and then went on to, to bigger organizations now work for research institutions or other NGOs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, before we pass the floor to general open questions, I just would like to ask, um, we've had, heard some examples of um, youth work in the area, and I just wondered, do we have any other youth in the room who would like to um, comment on any of the work that they do? We also have this, um, I've been to, I, 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 I've been dying to give this a go. We have this new thing, um, I've been to many meetings of the subsidiary bodies, but rather than passing around a microphone, which is so boring, we now have these throwable microphones. Um, if that's too intimidating, but you would still like to make an intervention, we can also just pass it to you. But um, first of all, yes, do we have any other youth? We have one. Can you catch? Can I throw? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to everybody. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Benedetta. I'm a young medical doctor now, yes. And I'm part of an association that is called Italian Climate Network. And there is an Italian uh, NGO on climate change, of course. And one of the projects that we are doing is promote uh, climate change in high school. We have lessons, we go to school, and we try to focus on the, uh, in the links between climate change and five topics. There are climate change and human rights, climate change and negotiation, also to uh, interest the, the students on the, the, mecha the big mechanism that is behind the, the international level. Then we have climate change and technology and social media also, climate change and waste, and the climate change and health. This year we covered like uh, 30 lessons in all uh, in all Italy, and it was very interesting to see how students are starting to get involved in the climate change issue. And I think that education can be one of the solutions to bring the, the a real climate action. And so, thank you. Nothing else. Thank you very, thank you very much. No, I If there is, is there somebody else as well? Would you like to pass on the microphone? I, I know her, I know Benedetta, because we're working together for Italian Climate Network. I'm Samantha, a medical doctor too. And I just wanted to share a new project um, Italy is conducting within the G7 uh, Italian presidency. Um, the project is very new and it's large and it involves the, um, the study of the uh, um, assess the impact of climate change uh, on health. But a, a part, um, a specific part of this project is involving young medical uh, professionals providing training course for general practitioners and pediatricians, not only in order to raise the awareness on the topic, but also to um, potentially create a new network of sentinel doctors um, under an appropriate epidemiological surveillance system. So this is, thank you. No one else? Thank you very much for your work as well that you do. Do you want to? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Do you want to check that back this way? Oh, I thought we were going to have a new <laughs> chief thrower there. Um, right now, I'd, I'd like to now open the floor to everybody. If you have questions on anything that you've heard from our presenters here today, we have the, um, the youth delegates here up on the table, but we also have the other speakers who are still in the room. We've put their names back up here. So if you would like to target a question to a particular person, we can, we can also do that. So the floor is yours. One question? You ready to catch? 
Thanks, James. My name is Tiffany Hodgson. I'm from the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, just two quick questions. I'll be I'll be brief. So, first question is to Gerardo. Did you take into account mental health when you were doing the analysis of co-benefits of mitigation? And then the second question is um, to the, the medical doctors and students. <laughs> first of all, just to say that I didn't know doctors could be eloquent until this evening because the doctors <laughs> I've seen have not been so. But um, the question I have is, um, so the workshops look really good that have been undertaken with medical students. Have you seen that there's some kind of momentum in terms of integrating climate change into the syllabus of medical schools? Who wants it? Yeah. Gerardo, do you want to take the first question? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> so in the work on co-benefits, we still have not taken into account mental health effects because what happens is that the evidence on the uh, response functions is not very solid. However, we have taken that into account in our work on the health effects of extreme weather events, uh, particularly uh, heat waves and flooding. And so it is a lot more developed in that area, and I suspect that it's going to continue like that for the time being. But eventually, of course, mental health will have to make it also to the other side of the equation. Great. And now to one of our eloquent medical doctors. Would you? Okay, I could start. Should I be using this one as well? <laughs> 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 Uh, okay, uh, I can only speak for what's happening in Sweden. You might have a different opinion, but uh, so far from when I've been studying, uh, there hasn't been anything about climate changes, not even when we read about global health. Uh, but I believe it's starting to change. And that's also one of the questions we're working with in this uh, climate group I'm in to talk to the universities and to try to implement more of uh, climate change is uh, education. So I, I believe it's starting to get a bit bigger. Nina? And from an IFMSA um, side, I can add that it is definitely something that there is a momentum in <coughs> trying to do. I'm not sure I would say there is a momentum in accomplishing it. Um, I think we work with, when you work with universities, you oftentimes work with very sort of old fashioned institutions, and it's hard to, as medical students, change the curricula. Um, but one of the things we do is that we have um, made a policy statement, as we call it in IFMSA. So we have gathered at our General Assembly and we have voted upon a policy so that national members can go up to their universities and say that there is 1.3 million medical students from 127 different countries who is pushing for this. And it's specifically mentioned in this policy statement that we have on climate change and health, that it is something that needs to be incorporated into the medical curriculum in a way that prepares medical students to um, help to adapt climate um, readiness in health systems. Andres, do you want to add something? Right, okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm also just going to use my prerogative of moderator here, but also my experience from working in climate change at WHO. Um, it's also something, incorporation of climate change into medical curricula and syllabi is actually something that we have also been encouraging. And we do have a few um, good examples in the European region where this is this has worked. And, and one example is Kazakhstan, for example. We worked with them to actually develop a climate change and health curriculum. Uh, and it's also been seen that with um, a lot of the health impacts that some of them, if they're going to be very new and different to what the countries have seen, we do need to make sure that the next generation of doctors is going to be able to recognize what these impacts are going to be on their patients. So yes, it's something that we've been supporting as well. Okay, any any further questions for our panelists? Got one way back there. That's that's a long throw. I'll, I'll do my best. It doesn't matter if we drop it. Oh, wow. <laughs> In one of the previous sessions, they had a rugby play and apparently nearly took someone out face first as the, uh, he was okay, chucking but it. It's, um, good. it's a good training <laughs> and it's the end of the day, so perhaps <laughs> we can show it forward and backward and <laughs> have some nice exercise. Um, my name is Jutta Litvinovic. I'm working for the German Ministry of Environment uh, on climate change and health. And um, as well as uh, I'm co-chair of the uh, WHO Europe uh, European uh, Working Group on Health uh, in Climate Change, while within WHO uh, Europe we are considering uh, climate change and health very intensely since 2008. And uh, of course uh, the 
main subjects we are focusing on uh, are uh, heat. And so WHO Europe has a, a heat health action plan. And on this basis, we have uh, developed now within Germany with all the uh, uh, 16 uh, different uh, federal states uh, guidance uh, how to um, provide heat, heat health action plans. And um, so I'm very happy that uh, from the medical side, uh, there is also some work coming now because we had a lot started from the environmental side. But then finally, when it comes to practice, we need uh, uh, the medical uh, practitioners uh, as well as, for example, the vector borne diseases. How should ordinary uh, practitioners know about it? And uh, of course, uh, there is also the WHO initiative to reduce the vector borne diseases. That's a very ambitious uh, uh, aim they are uh, going for. And um, well, of course, uh, for example, um, we consider dengue as uh, the most uh, uh, vector borne disease in, in focus, whereas malaria for, for us, it's more a question of poverty and uh, not uh, so much in the focus like, um, uh, like dengue. And um, for this, within uh, WHO Europe, we have uh, five different climatic zones, and there's a lot of uh, different um, impacts of climate change studies uh, on health, which we are already undertaken. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot provided to share, also with the different toolkits and uh, uh, training uh, uh, um, parts, uh, which we can also uh, share if uh, there is any interest. And um, of course, um, I'm also now with a G7 as a environmental part supporting uh, the health part and the Italians have the one planet one health uh, uh, issue on and I think this is very important because finally human health depends on the health of the environment, the uh, plants and the animals. So it's finally all combined and for this it's, uh, it's a very good um, initiative uh, uh, that is started and um, we hope that um, a lot can be done to, um, to tackle uh, the problems uh, on health caused by climate change and I think we're on a good way and uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. We can. Whoa! Well done. <laughs> Blimey, put me to shame. Anybody else? Thank you. I, um, thank you, Jutta Litvinovich, chair of our um, um, working group on health and climate change. I think that was a, a nice intervention there, just highlighting some of the um, the work that we, that's that's happening in our member states. We have a we have a few more minutes. If there are any more questions in the in the room, was that maybe a question? <laughs> okay, then. Oh, one question. Last one. Not a question. Go on. Do you want to make a comment? Thank you. Uh, and and sorry to take the floor again. Maybe I should have let everybody leave. I was. Uh, <laughs> A tough choice, but I, I did want to add on, on one of the questions earlier uh, about climate change and its impacts on uh, mental health, that, that that's part of the perspective from which OHCHR's work was done, um, and that one of the, the most substantial impacts of climate change now and going forward uh, is the displacement or migration of, of persons. Um, and, and that obviously has substantial uh, mental health impacts when, when people are moving from their homes uh, because of changing climate. And it's not always just a disaster or a sudden onset disaster that causes people to move. Um, it's also 
things and will increasingly be things like drought and slow onset uh, events. And, and so that's an area that we're looking at and, and an area that's, that's examined in, in some of our studies. And then the other thing I, I wanted to, to mention is that there, there has been some great work done by the human rights treaty bodies, which I, I referenced some of that, that earlier. But in, in our collaboration with WHO in the past, and, and uh, in particular at, at the 22nd Conference of the Parties in Morocco, we, we had a expert panelist on, on the joint UN event there uh, from the New Zealand Climate and Health Alliance, who is a Maori doctor um, and, and working on these issues of, of climate change and human rights. And he came and spoke um, about the, the particular impacts of climate change on, on uh, indigenous peoples and on the Maori people in New Zealand, but also about the engagement of, of the New Zealand Climate and Health Alliance with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, sorry, with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which is the human rights treaty body that monitors implementation of the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that engagement resulted in some recommendations for the New Zealand government about how to address the impacts of climate change on children's right uh, to to health, and and so I think that is is a really interesting example of how to mobilize the the treaty bodies and the human rights machinery to to address uh, climate issues. So thank you uh, and for allowing me to exercise this opportunity to speak again. And sorry to everybody for keeping you longer. Good save. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your additional contribution there, Ben. Okay, um, in the interest of good mental health, I think we will call that the end of the day. I highly recommend you all have a lovely walk along the banks of the Rhine, get some fresh air, and um, I wish you all a very pleasant evening and a final round of applause to all our panelists. Thank you very much. It's been I still aber kann die jeder verbinden? Was? Huh? Ah, you have to check it out. I think you have to.